Australia's state and territory governments have all committed to reach net zero emissions by 2050 or earlier, and the federal government has indicated they'd like to meet this goal too. But to get there, Australia needs to dramatically cut its emissions across each sector of the economy. Some sectors, such as transport, have had lower emissions since the COVID-19 pandemic, but those emissions are set to rebound to pre-pandemic levels. Australia is not on track for net zero and urgently needs good policies to push its emissions down. I'm Kat Clay, Head of Digital Communications, and today with me is Alison Reeve, Grattan's Energy and Climate Change Fellow, and James Ha, Associate, to talk about their new report series for 2021, Towards Net Zero, which looks at practical policies to build momentum towards achieving net zero emissions across each sector of the Australian economy. The first report in the series on transport is out now, and we'll be checking in with the team throughout the year on this important topic. So welcome, Alison. This is your first ever Grattan podcast since you've come on board. Can you tell us about this exciting series and why you're doing it now? Thanks, Kat. It's really exciting to be on the podcast. So our series, new series, focuses on ways that governments can put Australia on the pathway towards achieving a goal of net zero emissions by 2050. Like you said, um, all Australian governments have a commitment of one sort or another towards net zero. And coming up at the end of this year is the COP26 conference in Glasgow, which is the major climate change conference at which countries will be upping their ambition um, on climate change policy. So that's why we're doing it now. The approach that we're taking is going sector by sector because for now that seems to be the most practical and politically feasible way to start reducing emissions. There are literally thousands of activities in the Australian economy that contribute to greenhouse gas emissions, but roughly in 2020, around a third of our emissions came from electricity, a third from industrial and mining activities, around 18% from transport and 13% from agriculture and land. And to give you an idea of the scale of the task to reach net zero, between 2005 and 2019, emissions fell by around 6 million tonnes a year. And the government is projecting that between 2020 and 2030, they're going to fall by around 3.5 million tonnes a year. To be on track for net zero, emissions need to fall by 17 million tonnes per year between now and 2050. So that's three to five times faster than we've achieved before. So we're way off track for getting to that goal and we're facing a really big task. Now, the thing is, when you're facing a really big task, the best thing you can do is get started and tackle it bit by bit. And that's what our recommendations in this report series are about. We want to make some practical suggestions that governments can do now that will put us on the pathway to net zero by 2050. Thanks, Alison. And we certainly look forward to hearing from you throughout the year on this topic. So, James, the first report is on the transport sector. How much does transport contribute to Australia's emissions? The transport sector contributed 94 million tonnes of emissions, uh, or 18% of Australia's total in 2020. Um, and that was 7 million tonnes down from the previous year, 2019, um, mostly due to the COVID-19 pandemic affecting flights and because lockdowns restricted the amount that we were driving around our cities. So of these emissions, almost two thirds are from light vehicles, uh, which includes cars, utes and vans. Um, and heavy road vehicles, which include trucks and buses, uh, were almost a quarter of the total. Um, in normal years, domestic flights make up less than a tenth of our transport emissions, um, and, and even less you know, in 2020 and, and in 2021 due to the pandemic. And the rest of the emissions in the sector are from smaller sources. So things like diesel-powered trains, ferries, other boats, and motorcycles. There are different ways to decarbonize each of these subsectors within, within transport. Uh, and some technologies are more mature than others, especially for the light vehicle fleet, where battery electric cars like Teslas are the obvious solution um, because they have zero tailpipe emissions and they're already on our roads today. Now, if they are charged from the grid, then they might add emissions to our electricity sector. Um, but the grid is getting cleaner um, every day as more renewables enter. 
So over the whole life of an electric car, it'll almost certainly have lower operating emissions than an equivalent petrol or diesel car. So Alison, there's certainly been a lot of excitement about electric vehicles or EVs, but Australia has a limited number of EV models available for purchase compared to other countries, and they tend to be more expensive than petrol cars. Why is this the case and what should governments do about it? Kat, you're right that EVs are still more expensive than petrol and diesel cars, although there are a lot of analysts who expect that in some markets that difference is going to disappear by around 2025. The thing is that car manufacturers don't preference sending electric vehicles to the Australian markets. They tend to make those cars available to the markets where they can sell more of them. And those tend to be markets where there are policies in place that are shifting the share of the market towards electric vehicles and away from petrol and diesel vehicles. The thing is that because Australia doesn't have those policies, the manufacturers don't send us many cars because they're not as certain that they can sell them here. The policy that's been shown to work in lots of different markets for um, encouraging the uptake of electric vehicles is an emission standard for cars. Now, this does two things. First of all, it um, pushes manufacturers to make petrol and diesel vehicles more efficient, which means that if you do buy a petrol and diesel vehicle, it will save you money. But the other thing is that as the standard becomes more stringent over time, it's easier for manufacturers to meet it by sending more electric cars into that market. So we've recommended that Australia introduce a national emission standard for cars. Um, because the effect of that will be to increase the choice of vehicles for Australian motorists, including more choice of electric vehicles, um, and at more price points as well. And over time, what it will do is shift the fleet away from petrol and diesel cars and towards electric vehicles. To reach the goal of net zero emissions in 2050, we need to phase out sales of new petrol and diesel cars by 2035. Now, this is because cars tend to last a long time. Um, It's like 20 20 years or more. So a lot of the cars that we buy in the, the 2020s and the 2030s will still be on the road in 2050. So we either want those cars to be really efficient petrol and diesel vehicles or to be electric. The other thing that we've recommended governments could do is to scrap some of the inefficient taxes and regulations around cars that will help make vehicles cheaper. So these are things like um, stamp duty or motor vehicle duty, um, the import duty on cars that's coming into the country, and also the luxury car tax. Taking those inefficient taxes off will make electric vehicles less expensive for all consumers. So Alison, I do really enjoy taking my four-wheel drive on long road trips out into the national parks. And I like the idea of getting an EV, but I can't risk running out of juice in the middle of the bush. And there's not many PowerPoints out there. One of the biggest criticisms of electric vehicles is that they aren't suited to Australian conditions and for the way Aussies use their cars. Is that a barrier to good policy here? Look, it shouldn't be, Kat. Now, while it's true that Australians do tend to prefer larger cars and we do take road trips and we do take camping trips and, you know, I take camping trips as well, most of the trips that we make in our cars are short. You know, we drop the kids off at school, we drive to the supermarket, we might drive to and from work. Um, And so most of those trips are well within the range and the capability of an electric vehicle. The other thing to remember is that the majority of households have more than one car. So an electric vehicle will be useful for some of the trips that households make, but a different type of car will be useful for others. So when we talk about bringing in um, a vehicle emission standard and encouraging uptake of electric cars, we're not talking about making people buy a car that doesn't suit their needs. What we're saying is that Electric cars will be the right car for the job for a lot of the trips that families take. So, it, you know, it can be a good idea to buy an electric car for those. And over time, as manufacturers expand their range of models, you will be able to take your EV camping or on your round Australia road trip because there will be a model that's suitable to do that. Well, that would certainly be exciting for me um, because I spend a lot of money on petrol keeping that four-wheel drive going. So James, while I've spotted a few charging ports at servos these days, does Australia actually have the infrastructure to support the increased take-up of EVs? 
We've certainly got the infrastructure to have more EVs than we've got now, but not yet the infrastructure to get us all the way to 100%, say. Um, so to date, the uptake of electric vehicles has been pretty dismal. They were less than 1% of sales um, last year. Um, but as Alison mentioned, in the short term, there's lots of people who, for whom an electric vehicle might be suitable as their second car, um, and, and they might charge it at home, say. And we know that the vast majority of electric car charging is done at home. So that means that even without having additional infrastructure built, um, there is a segment of the population, um, larger than 1%, that may be willing to purchase an electric vehicle. But if electric vehicles are going to become the norm, then we need to reduce barriers for those drivers who can't just charge at home. Uh, and that means that over the longer term, we need to get charging infrastructure into the car parks of apartments and businesses. Um, and we need to make sure that there's convenient public charging in suburbs where there's no off-street parking. And for renters like me, even if the property has a garage, it might not have an electrical outlet um, available there. Um, and tenants can't install one without the landlord's approval. Um, so making sure that there's electrical cabling to any car space in a rented property uh, is also an issue that states can address through their minimum tenancy standards. So, James, shouldn't we just get more people on public transport, though? So more people on public transport would help to reduce emissions, but it's very hard to scale that up sufficiently by 2050 to meet our net zero target. So even if we doubled public transport use in our major cities, cars would still be the dominant form of transport. And doubling public transport use would take a lot of infrastructure to achieve. Um, and we're already, you know, in Melbourne, say, we're seeing um, a lot of transport infrastructure come online um, with the Melbourne Metro under construction um, and in Sydney, the Sydney Metro. Um, so there's certainly investment is happening, but it's hard to see us growing our public transport share to anything like 100%. Some people are excited about autonomous self-driving cars, which might reduce the number of private vehicles on the road. Um, and that's certainly a possibility, but those cars themselves will need to be zero emissions. Um, and they'll also need some way to charge. So virtually any practical pathway to net zero is going to require us switching the vehicle fleet to zero emissions vehicles. Uh, and we need to plan for them now. Alison, we've spent a bit of time talking about your everyday driver. But what are the options available for reducing emissions in heavy transport and aviation? What it looks like from the vantage point of 2021 is that in the 2030s and the 2040s, we're likely to be using electric trucks for shorter freight distances. So that's the sort of um, delivery of freight around cities. But then for the longer distances, so, you know, between Sydney and Melbourne or Darwin and Adelaide, we'll be looking at hydrogen fuel cell trucks. And that's because electric trucks use batteries and batteries are heavy. And for longer distances, a heavier truck means you carry less freight. So it can actually be advantageous, we think, from where we what we can see now, to use a hydrogen fuel cell truck for those distances. For aviation, it's really not clear yet how we're going to eliminate those emissions. This is probably one of the hardest parts of the transport sector. One thing that does look prospective um, is renewable hydrocarbons. So these are fuels that are chemically identical to aviation fuel, but instead of being made from oil, they're made from renewable sources like plants. Now, at the moment, those are quite expensive and they're only manufactured in very small amounts. Um, but that does look like something that potentially will be the solution in aviation, but it's just hard to tell right now. The other part of um, the transport story, of course, is long distance shipping. And the solution there is not that clear either. This might be another application for hydrogen. It might also be another zero emissions fuel like ammonia. And there's lots of research and trials going on around the world in these sort of harder to tackle sectors like heavy transport and aviation. And to be honest, the story changes a little bit each week. What we've recommended in the report is that it would be a good idea for government to make some smart bets on a couple of different options for trucks so that we can start to get a clearer picture of what the best option is going to be in Australian conditions. So we think that encouraging some investment into um, using renewable fuel and making renewable fuel widely available across the country would be a good idea. We think we can do that through a renewable fuel standard. This would also, building that capacity in 
being able to manufacture and use renewable fuel would also potentially help the aviation sector in the longer term. We also think it would be a good idea for government to support some targeted trials of hydrogen trucks as well so that we can figure out what are the routes and the duty cycles where those trucks will work in Australia. James, the last question for you, given how big a task this is and how much it requires a radical culture shift around driving in Australia, is net zero in the transport sector realistically achievable by 2050? It's doable, but it's going to take bold policy today. So governments have set the direction. Uh, We have all states and territory governments committed to net zero by 2050, and the Prime Minister uh, would like to see us there as well, preferably. And so with that direction set, they need to follow through with the policies to meet their targets. Um, The policies that we've suggested will get the sector, will get the transport sector on the right track. But even these probably aren't enough to completely decarbonize transport by 2050. And that means either uh, offsetting some emissions into the future or additional policies will be needed uh, to finish the job. That's why it's important to take an economy-wide view to see which sectors will need offsets uh, and how many and for how long. And that's one of the reasons why we're doing a series of five reports on all of the sectors. Now, this would be a lot simpler if we had an economy-wide mechanism to reduce emissions, such as a carbon price, which would find the cheapest uh, emissions reductions in each sector instead of requiring sector-specific policies. But the political history of carbon pricing in Australia means that neither major party is likely to adopt it as a policy anytime soon. Um, And so in the meantime, we should absolutely be making progress with sector-specific policies. I think the important point you make in the report is that we do need to start now because if we delay any longer it becomes a more significant crunch towards that deadline of 2050 and it becomes more expensive for Australians to meet that goal as well. So if you've enjoyed this podcast today, you can actually read this report uh, for free on our website online at grattan.edu.au. It'll be right there on the homepage. I'd like to thank you so much, Alison and James, for coming on the podcast today and talking about what is a significant issue for this year and the years to come. I'd also like to sincerely thank the Susan McKinnon Foundation for its generous and timely support for this particular project. We'd love to keep talking with you about the issues raised in today's podcast. You can chat to us on Twitter at Grattan Inst and on social media at Grattan Institute. As always, take care, especially if you're in lockdown. And thanks so much for listening.